connect again. Welcome back. This is the CAD and now mechanical design class three, which is the next class in the series sponsored by the Academy of Excellence. Uh, before I go further, can you all hear me? All right, microphone's okay. Okay, I can see Peyton, thumbs up. Yeah, I'd appreciate like inputs like that. So to introduce the course, just like the CAD2 class, it's going to be co-taught by me, I'm Eugene, and also Jack, who I'm sure most of you know by now. And the objective of this class is to transition away from kind of 3D printing, which was one of the focuses of the previous classes and focus more on design. So one of the ideas of this class is that there's going to be an entire course long project and you're going to design a simple robot using the CAD tools you know in Onshape that can achieve simple tasks like moving around and moving objects from one area to a target area. And so through this, hopefully you learn a lot about the um, relevant simple machines and machine parts that will help you in your future as you go into engineering related projects or classes. To give you an overview of what this class will be like, so for the first three weeks, that's including today and the next two weeks, we'll start on our first project, which is the robot arm. And in terms of other topics, we're going to discuss simple machines and how to really pick parts from a catalog to design your robots, which is something that we briefly touched on last class, but we'll get more into it this week or this class. The next two weeks after that will be the second project for the class, which is the chassis of the robot. So kind of like the body. And in that time period, we'll be talking about servos and motors and kind of how you drive the robot. The last three weeks, which are week six through eight, will be the final project in a way in which we're going to make the robots transmission and put everything together. So during this time, we'll also learn about what kind of sensors exist that you might use. Um, we'll learn how to analyze physically um, systems that you design. And finally, for the last class, we want to have some special event. And so for this design that you'll be working on throughout the entire course, we want you to be able to have an opportunity to share it with your classmates and to us. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. In terms of expectations, just like I'm sure you're used to by now, the class will have part of a lecture in the beginning. And after that, we'll have some guided classwork time where we might work through something together, or I might give you time to work on your projects, and I'll be here to answer questions. Outside of class, we'll have some homework assignments and project work, similar to last class. And as I mentioned, there will be two of us teaching class. So next week, you'll see Jack again. So let's get right into it. This is the robot overview. And so you might be wondering what I'm talking about when I talk about robots, since there's such a variety of things that we regularly call robots. Um, specifically, what we're referring to is what pertains to these like student robotics competitions. And so throughout your middle school, eventually high school careers, you're going to have perhaps the opportunity to participate in these student teams. I see Peyton is mentioning in chat that he's in fact in one. And so I'm sure you have then some idea of what these things are like. I have a short video here for those of you who might not know yet or who might not be part of a team but are interested in one. Um, so just for the context for people who don't know, like there's a link in the chat to a video that describes one of the very popular or well-known competitions called FTC. And so my goal with this class is hopefully that the skills that you learn here will be applicable to your robotics competitions if you do those. And also just that you learn something useful that you can apply to your other engineering teams or classes or your own personal projects in the future. So I sent you to the link to the video. You can watch it yourself. I'm sure the video quality through Zoom is not great, but I'll have it on the share screen.
And so as you look at these videos, these are basically what I mean for this class when I talk about robots. You can see it has like a body that everything is attached to. It has some wheels that allow it to move. It's got electronic parts that give you some control over what the robot does. You saw there that it was using an arm to grab something and now it's putting it down somewhere else. And so when you first look at a system like this, um, it's obviously a lot of parts that are moving together that have to work around each other. And that might seem daunting to design at first, as you learn like a kind of design process, I hope that by the end of the class, you'll be comfortable in seeing something like this, breaking it down into what components it's made out of, and hopefully being able to do something like this on your own. So just out of curiosity, like of those of you who are in robotics competitions, can you tell me like which ones you're in or is it FTC or some other first competition? We didn't do it because of COVID, so. Okay. What was the competition? Uh, we just worked on the uh, engineering notebook and that was it. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty unfortunate that a lot of events that happened in the spring and summer last year didn't happen. But yeah, so there you go. Second videos, if you're interested, you can find it in the slides that will be posted on Google Classroom. And on that note, please everyone make sure that you have access to the Google Classroom as after each class, we'll be posting the slides there and other materials that you might need. So to build off what we were just talking about, the robots that we might be designing might look something like this. For this class, we don't necessarily have to go perhaps as detailed as these, but just something that has all of the fundamental parts and that with more time, you would be able to expand into something like these competition um, robots. So as you mentioned in the middle, the center of the robot that holds things together, we have a chassis or a frame. What allows the robot to move are its wheels, which have to be connected to a motor somehow. And so that entire system is what we call a drivetrain. A lot of robots, especially for this context, might have an arm that allows it to interact with its environment and pick things up. And finally, there's the electronics and control systems that allow the robot both to be controlled by a driver and also perhaps move autonomously. And so keep this in mind, we'll come back to it shortly, but we'll move on to our first topic of the session, which is kind of motion in 3D. And so any single rigid object has what are called degrees of freedom, which are kind of motions that it can have within a three-dimensional space. And there are six of them. So you can imagine that if you have some object, it can move translationally. So its position is just moving and there are three directions, the X, Y, and Z. And so if you remember from like the on-shape workspace, you'll have like your three axes, you can go up and down, left and right, and forward and backward. And that's kind of the translational degrees of freedom that all objects have or can have. The other three degrees of freedom are kind of rotational. So about each axis, let's say this is my Y axis, um, an object is able to rotate about that axis, which means that it's rotating symmetrically in that direction. So just like the X and Y and Z, we also have three rotational degrees of freedom, which means in total, we have six degrees of freedom for a single rigid object. Now what gets, what can make things more interesting is that when you combine objects that can move relative to each other, the total system might have more degrees of freedom than some of its components. And so you can imagine that the concept of degrees of freedom is pretty important.
question. As our first kind of discussion question, I want you to look first at the 3D printer. It's just a traditional 3D printer that you might be used to. And so for the system, like how many degrees of freedom does it have? And feel free to just unmute yourselves or type in the chat. I want you kind of to think about the translational and rotational degrees of freedom that a 3D printer has in its moving parts. Okay, Peyton says three. Do you want to tell us what those three are? Uh, forward, backward, or no, forward, left, and then like, like the X, Y, and Z. So it was like forward, backwards, left, right, and up and down. All right, that sounds reasonable. And so in this one, you kind of have one degree of freedom with the stage here. You can see it moves like in and out. And then the nozzle has kind of two degrees of freedom. It can move up and down and also kind of left and right. So that would be three translational degrees of freedom. The next one is kind of maybe funny, but how many degrees of freedom does a mouse cursor have? I want to see a couple answers. <clears throat> OK, does anyone else have ideas? It's just Peyton in this class. I want to hear one person say something. Wait, uh, the doorknob? Or the mouse cursor. But okay. you can also say the doorknob if you want. Uh, the mouse cursor has like um, all of them. I mean, all of them are like the X and Y axis. OK. Now that we've started the doorknob too, does anyone else have an idea of how many degrees of freedom a doorknob has? I think the doorknob only has one. Yeah, so um, I hope that exercise gave you something to think about. In terms of the mouse cursor, my interpretation is you can move kind of left and right, you can move up and down. And so that's your two degrees of freedom to move within the plane of your screen. For a door handle, I think this one is a bit trickier. Although the end of the doorknob does kind of move within space, if you think about it, all of the movement is constrained to kind of the mounting point of the doorknob. So it's really just rotating about the axis at which the handle is mounted. And so in that sense, I would say that it has one rotational degree of freedom. So hopefully that gave you some ideas. And now we'll introduce the first project for the class, which is the robot arm. So for the first three weeks, including this week, you're going to design and model your own robot arm. And the overall purpose of this is to eventually join with the rest of the robot that you'll be catting to form a complete robot that's able to pick up a wobble goal. And so a wobble goal is one of these objects here on the right. It's kind of a hemispherical bottom bell with a long stick. This whole thing's about, I think, less than one foot tall, weighs less than a pound or about one pound. And so hopefully you can imagine kind of holding one of these in your hand and you're going to design an arm that's able to pick this up. So things that I want you to consider, if you have a robot arm, like, what are some ways that you can attach it to the rest of the robot? Um, I guess I kind of want you to put out some responses to this. Like, what are some common ways that you can attach like one system of a more complex system to another part? So what can you use to attach, say, just an arm to the rest of a robot without the arm? Uh, in the cat or in like real life? Both. Uh, so in, the thing in the cat, in the cat, you can use the fashion mate or like the revolute mate. And, like okay. in real life, you can use like a nail or like okay. maybe some really strong adhesive. Yeah, so fasteners like nails, bolts, screws, those would all work as would adhesives. Um, 
does anyone have an idea of why we might prefer one over the other? Like, I think we would choose bolts and like screws over adhesives because adhesives over time they might get like non sticky, they can fall. But then the nails, as long as they're stayed in place, they'll, they won't fall off unless someone like screws it off. Yeah, so those are all valid reasons to pick one kind over the other. Um, for the next question, what kind of subcomponents do you see within an arm? So maybe consider your own arm, like if you had to organize it into some distinct systems, what would you call those maybe? Um, your elbow, your above okay. the elbow and like your, from your elbow to your wrist and then okay. your thumb. Anything else, Drew? Seems like you didn't finish your sentence. Um, wait, what? Was there anything else you wanted to say? No. It seems like you got, okay. Yeah, so Drew said the elbow, like kind of the forearm. Is there anything else really important in an arm that lets it do things that arms do? Uh, muscles or um, like spider mates or like, or resolute mates to like make the arm move. Yeah, so some kind of way to give the arm degrees of freedom, like these revolute mates, and like something to drive it, so like muscles, something to give it energy. So, yeah, those are all good answers. And how is a robot arm able to move? It's probably able to like, yeah, uh, if it's like a control, like it'll also be like be able to revolute. So like, it will be connected to something that that, that like uh like in Legos, you have that weird looking fork thing that be connected to this like a uh, connector, and then you'll be able to move back and forth, up and down. Okay. Yeah, I'm not completely sure what the fork connector is, but based it's on what like you said. It's like a Lego. It's like you have like a rod on one side, and then you have like a hand thingy. And you have to like put it on the line. Yeah, okay. So is it kind of like a motor? Something different? Well, that Lego thing's like a fork. So like one piece of it's like a fork shape, and then the other piece is more like a like a like a stick. So then you would be able to connect those, those two pieces. Yeah. And then on the like the little stick one is like grind or like little like like gear pieces, something like that. So like it'll be going up and down. Okay. Um I think I might see. Yeah, so those are all like things that you probably need in a mechanical assembly, like an arm. And I guess if I were to add one thing, it might be some kind of power source. You need something to produce torque like a motor so that you can actually make the whole thing move the way you want it to. So that was a good discussion so far. And we're going to, I guess, jump into the conceptual part of the project. So based on what you talked about, like your arm needs an elbow. So that's kind of like a base. You need it, you need a way for the arm to attach attach to the rest of your body, right? And so likewise, the robot arm needs some way to attach to the robot. And in this like sample arm that I made really quickly, the base is kind of this square at the bottom. And you can imagine like in those holes, you might put some bolts in there to attach it to the body of a robot. So you need some kind of base. Something else you probably need is the arm itself, the parts of the arm that give it enough reach to actually reach the target that you're aiming for. And also with enough degrees of freedom, like we talked about, both translational and rotational, to actually be able to manipulate and pick up the goal. And finally, you probably want something at the end of the arm, like a hand that gives you a way to firmly grab an object. So I want you to take a few minutes here, just on a piece of paper or something, write down a few 
like ideas, maybe draw some sketches with your pen and pencil of what these systems might look like. Like don't be influenced at all by this CAD. It's just, if you have no ideas of what I'm talking about, it's kind of like at the top, you have a hand, like your hand, your arm. But in terms of like translating all of these ideas into CAD, I just want you to brainstorm some ideas and maybe at the end we can share what we thought for each of these systems. Wait, so are we just drawing the, the claw we see? So for each system, kind of like the base, the arm and the hand, I just want you to jot down some ideas, different ways that you could achieve these parts. Maybe like how you would go about starting this model in CAD and on shape. Just things like that, just general brainstorming ideas. Well, are we doing this in CAD right now? No, just like on a pen and paper, maybe draw some ideas, write down some notes. Maybe think about similar things that you've seen in your personal experiences. So I'll give you a few more seconds and then maybe look at what you wrote down, pick a couple of things that you want to share with the rest of the class. All right, so does anyone start off with want to share about some things they thought about robot arms? Like for the draw, like a, so. What I wrote is like I just wrote like the robot arm. Like what we we can do is like we can have a revolution on all the connections. So we can like make it have many like the DLF. 
Okay. Anything else? Or anyone else? I was sort of thinking the same thing. Okay. I guess there were some places where you've seen like real robotic arms. Uh, factories. Okay. All right, and you can imagine like, although most arms are very different because they have very different applications, a lot of the things that you have to consider, like how you're going to mount them, how far they need to reach, what they need to be able to do, are all still concerns that they think about. So for this class, we're going to start off with just the base. And what we're gonna to do today is kind of different from what we've done before in previous classes. So it's much more open-ended. There's still going to be some constraints, but instead of just following what we're doing or just following a drawing, you're going to come up with something on your own. So the first constraint is kind of the bounding box. So the maximum size that this object can have. So no matter what you make, we want it to fit inside of this imaginary box that's eight inches by eight inches by eight inches. And you can imagine that's a restriction that might come about just because of the maximum allowable size of the robot. In this case, it's just, this is what it is. And so as you start your design, make sure that you don't cut something that ends up being larger than eight inches cubed. The second constraint is that you want a mounting bolt pattern. So we want your base at the end to have four holes at least that go all the way through, kind of like you see in this example. And that's so that you can have bolts that'll allow you to mount the base to the chassis of a robot. So you want clearance holes for bolts, which means you want to follow a standard bolt size. So if you're familiar with standard screws and bolts you could use a tap chart if not just go with something like one quarter or use the whole tool that we talked about when we were doing the air engines and finally make sure you leave like enough space just free around the area of the bolt because you can imagine when you're putting things in and you're assembling this in real life you want to have enough space where you can actually fit the bolt where the hole is and maybe like fit a wrench in there too, so you can tighten it down without being obstructed by something that you designed. And the last thing that you have as a constraint is that you need an arm attachment point. So it's kind of these two tabs that are sticking out in this example. We want you to have some kind of hole like here to mount the first arm member to the base. And there needs to be enough clearance so that later on when you design the arm, that the arm is going to be able to attach the base. So basically this is what you're working with. All you know is how big the maximum size that you can make this base, that it needs to have at least four bolt holes and that you need some way to attach the arm to it later. And so at this point, I just want you to go to Onshape, create a new document and start um, designing your base. If you want to start like, sketch out some ideas. Maybe you have some good ones from our brainstorming that we did a few minutes ago. But like um, from this point, I'll give you some time to work on the base and to start the CAD. If you have questions, let me know and we can take a look at it together. And in a few more minutes, I'll start like CAD demonstration of something, general things that you might want to look for as you do your design. But for now, just get started.
if you have any questions, even if it's not strictly about the base, yeah, feel free to ask if it's about the course in general or about this project in general, about robotics competitions and such, and I'll try to answer them. And if you're having trouble getting started, don't be afraid to speak up or send me a chat message. In a few minutes, I'll open up on shape myself. So I'll just copy all the constraints into the chat for you. So you'll have access to them.
And as you're working, I'll bring up a few points of interest. So for those of you who are curious about like standard hole sizes and hardware, we talked a little bit about bolts and threads when our McMaster lesson last class. And so kind of an extension to that is what's called a drill and tab chart. And so when you're making things in a machine shop or just using standard hardware from a hardware store, you'll find that almost all of the standard like screws and bolts will fall under these general categories. So we got our number drills and our standard drills and screws. And so if you want to use a specific type of bolt, the way that you find what hole that you need to CAD to be able to fit that bolt is something you can find in what's called like these tab charts. If you just look them up, you'll be able to find one. So this one actually doesn't tell you the standard clearance fits, but the major diameter itself is a safe diameter to use. So for a quarter bolt, you'd want a quarter inch hole. Something to note is that the on shape hole tool actually takes care of it for you. So you can just input, if you use the hole tool instead of an extruded cut, what kind of hardware you're using, and it'll create the correct size diameter. Uh, Eugene, I don't get the base part. Like I've been figure, trying to figure it out, but I, I don't know. So well, what, I don't get the base must fit within A times A times A or A by A. Okay. So the first constraint is just kind of a limit to how big you can make it since just looking at a CAD model, you don't really know how big it is in real life, right? This thing I'm that's on my screen right now, this could be like really small, it could be very large. And so first constraint just defines that the length and the width and the height of the entire base need to be less than eight inches each. So it can't be 10 inches long. It can't be 10 inches long, even if it's less than eight inches in another dimension. If you had an imaginary box that's just an eight inch cube, you'd be able to place your entire base inside of it. Oh, so we can make like our own size for each thing? Great. Okay, thank you. Another thing to consider as you work on the arm attachment point or when you get there is how are you going to achieve that first connection? So in the example that I show in the slides, it's kind of using a hinge. So you can see there's a hole and in that hole, you might have a pin and with the arm in that pin, it would have one rotational degree of freedom. It's kind of like your elbow, right? You can rotate about one axis and just that one axis. Some possible other things you might try if you're interested, you have a ball and socket joint. So that's kind of like your shoulder. If you think about how you have more than one degree of freedom rotationally, because you're able to rotate your elbow, like both the horizontal axis or horizontal plane and in a vertical plane. So if you're comfortable with catting a ball and socket, that's something you might try. Another option is a hinge. So if you, if you look at most of your doors, you'll notice it has a kind of hinge, which are two plates that have a pin holding them together. And so they have that one rotational degree of freedom again.
And in a few more minutes, I'll start my little CAD demo. There's no need to watch or follow along exactly, but if you just want to get some ideas or if you need a refresher on CAD, that's going to be available. I have a question. Okay. How much like do you want the circle to be? Sorry, could you repeat the question? How much do you want the circle size to be? So that's mostly up to you. Just make sure that it's something that a bolt could fit inside. So one quarter inch is What's safe. What's a recommended size? Sorry? What's a recommended size? One bolt that's very commonly used is a quarter inch and 20 threads per inch. So the clearance for that is 0 0.25 inches. One way that if you're not sure what to do, that you can do is to use the whole tool like we did for the steam engine. And so that just lets you have these options with the ANSI. In this case, it already knows Maybe I want a clearance hole in this case, and I can specify that I want a quarter inch hole. And like I mentioned before, another option is to look up a tap chart 
which will tell you the dimensions. And as you reach the last 10 minutes of class or so, I might ask a few of you to maybe share your designs. I'll let you share screen and you can tell us about what you've done so far. I need help for the wall tool. Okay. Um, what about the whole tool do you want help with? Uh, for the whole tool? Um, it's saying for me to, um, like, that's your place, but. So, in your sketch, did you plot points for the whole tool to find? Yeah, but wait. Okay. So in your sketch, I don't think right now you have the points that the whole tool can find, but once you place them, it should work. Right now the sketch is hidden. So in your left tree, just click the eye ball. And now you can see the points. And so using the whole tool, it should allow you to select those points. Um, I'm having trouble with the points, like the point, like I'm dimensioning the points. Okay. Uh. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who asked the question, uh, but it's Alex. Alex, okay. If you want to show us what you have trouble with, I'll take a look. Uh, here's my thing. Um, I, I, every time I click the dimension tool, it's like, I don't know where to dimension it. I click everywhere, but it just doesn't work. And uh, uh, I think that should work. Just type in a number there, and press enter. Right. Five. Okay. All right, so that worked. Now it still has one degree of freedom left, and at that point, you can still move up and down. Oh, so here? Is that here? Yeah. Oh. Oh. And so, using a mix of relations and dimensions, hopefully, you can fully define this sketch. Oh. So, a few more dimensions are probably needed. But it looks like you have your relations set up well. Oh, yeah. Oh. If you already have some relations, you might not need to dimension every single one. Just there might be a few like that one. And you can see that point turn black. So there you go. Oh, so I just have to keep doing that.
just keep in mind that some of those dimensions you don't need because you made them horizontal and vertical. Yeah, so there you go. And remember that once everything is black, it's fully defined. So once the sketch is fully defined, if you try to add more definition, it'll turn red. Okay. But you should be good. Thank you. So with five minutes left, if anyone who's made some good progress wants to share, I'm pretty, pretty interested to see what you've come up with so far. Yeah, just feel free to share your screen. Not sure, but I'm just not done with the I'm not done with the little curvy part on the top, but I'm yeah. working on it. That's fine. You don't need to finish during this class today, but any progress is good. Yeah, it looks good. I see you've got your four bolt holes. Seems like you're under eight inches squared. Yeah, I swear. And so hopefully everyone else, like hopefully everyone sees like the CAD flow that they will take to eventually make the whole thing. There's not too many different parts on it. Can I show my update? Sure. Okay, I'm still working on like the um the the coffee, but yeah, this is what I have so far. Yeah, it seems good. Um, and like eventually, you see, you'll be able to like do an extrude and extrude cuts from that sketch to make your tabs to hold the arm. So. Yeah, looks good. Okay. So maybe one more person if you want to show what you have so far. If not, I'll go back to the slides. The slides it is. So continue working on the space. Um, this is the first of three parts of the robot arm for the first project. Remember to keep in mind the constraints on the slide and this whole slide deck will be posted on Google Classroom a bit after the class ends. Next class, we want you to have the base finished because we're going to start working on the arm part of the arm. And so next week, we're going to continue to discuss various mechanisms, simple machines, and introduce the second part of this first project. So with that, I'll let you continue working to the end of the class. If you have any questions, I'll stay here to answer them. But otherwise, that is all that there is for the class. As a reminder, we're meeting every Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time.
I want to check with uh, Serena, Alex, Song. So they both are in the robotics team. So are you working on that, Serena and uh, Alex? Uh, yeah. Okay, can you screen, screen share what you have achieved so far in the class? Uh, not really. Like... Not That's okay. So how about Alex? Not ready. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. No. Oh, Alex Wu. How about you? Wait, what? Wait, what? The screen share what do you have done? Or maybe, yeah. Can you please? Oh, okay. And Jacob is to here. He has left, right? Okay, Jacob has left. Wait, like the for today's robot. Yeah, what do you have done? Yeah, what do you have done? Just to give an idea, like how much you can accomplish in class. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Good. So Peyton, thank you for sharing. How about you, Peyton? Class actually is already dismissed. If you are good, you can leave. I just want to uh, check. Nice. Good job. Thank you, Peyton. So how about the Daniel? Yeah. Okay, Daniel. Wow, nice, interesting. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, see you next class. Bye, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.